A bunch more accounting use cases for ChatGPT. Oh my gosh, yes! Meeting stuff. We've talked previously about how AI meeting assistants super helpful. Imagine if you had a transcript of every client meeting you've had for the last decade. It was searchable. You go through summaries, call clients out on their lies. We got a bunch of tools now that will give you transcripts of those meetings. But what if, say, I need help writing a follow-up email after a meeting? Take a look at this. Here's a 30-minute meeting transcript. It's actually from a recent podcast recording, but we won't worry about that. Give me a bullet list of helpful things I could send a follow-up email about. And be sure to call out anything that I actually like promised I would follow up on. And it looks fine. Generally touched on everything that was in the transcript. By the way, you see an office equipment here. We spent a whole week talking office setups on the podcast recently. Highly recommend. I'll link the first one up here. Something like 2,000 accountants have listened to every single one of those episodes. Turns out they would rather talk about offices than accounting. Me too though. Okay, why don't we uh, create a short email from one, three, seven, eight, and nine. Good enough for a starting point. Now, say your firm built a policy to create a standardized work paper for all meetings. Anytime someone has a meeting, gotta have a work paper for that meeting and like a specific output. Let's have it build a Word doc that can serve as this work paper. Now I'm gonna break this down into steps for ChatGPT. This is a good prompt engineering tip for bigger, more complex tasks, is to make it do them step by step. Here's the prompt, I'm just gonna plop it in there. You're gonna help me create a work paper to summarize meetings. Follow these steps. Step one, summarize all the happenings in the meeting. Step two, review that bullet list to make a summarized version of it, removing redundant items or items that changed based on later discussions. Oftentimes you'll say something at the beginning of the meeting, change your mind later on in the meeting, and meeting summarizers don't really capture this. So we're doing a detailed list and then a less detailed list that removes those things. Step number three, make a list of any items I promise to follow up on. Step four, create a Word document with a summary section and a follow-up section. And I'm gonna have it check in with me before continuing to each subsequent step. Okay, step one here, uh, covering a whole bunch of detail, which is what I want in the beginning. I don't want anything to slip through the cracks here. Step two, it's gonna reduce it, remove any uh, repetitive stuff or anything that got superseded by a later point. Now, if I wanted on either of these first steps, I could ask it to expand further or to remove certain ones. Okay, the output of step two is looking fine. I don't actually like though that it just gave me a flat hierarchy. So I'm gonna say add a parent hierarchy. It's gonna break those out a little more. That's a more helpful structure for me. Okay, that's fine, but let's say I just wanna use numbers one, six, and seven as follow-up items. I'm gonna say, let's throw out all but one, six, and seven, then proceed with step four. It's now running some code to create the Word file. Talk amongst yourselves. Here's the download link, and the file here looks fine. It removed all but the follow-up items that I actually wanted. Now, I'd probably build out this work paper a little further, require like, the client name, the ID, date, who's in the meeting, that sort of thing. And you could roll all this up into a reusable GPT. We did a past video on GPTs, but here's just how easy it is to create a reusable GPT that you could just like make once and then share with your colleagues. I'm gonna come over here to explore GPTs. I'm gonna open this in a new tab, then put it alongside the tab we were just looking at. I use a browser called ARC that's letting me do this, A-R-C. Highly recommend they just opened up ARC to uh, Windows users, actually. Anyways, two windows of ChatGPT side by side here. On the right, we're creating a new GPT, which is like a reusable conversation, kind of. I've got the Configure tab open. I'll name it uh, Meeting Work Paper Generator, and it creates work papers from meeting transcripts. Now for the instructions, I'm gonna tell it, your job is to create work papers from meeting transcripts via the following process. And I'm actually gonna jump back to the conversation we were just in, scroll up a bit. Where is it? Here it is. I'm just gonna copy paste that over into the GPT. And that's really it for the instructions. I'll add a conversation starter to prompt the user to upload their transcript. That just shows up at the bottom above the little message box. There's a couple other options down here. I'm just gonna disable them. And that's really all there is to it. I'm gonna hit the preview tab to take it for a spin. Bacalap. I'm gonna drag that transcript into there and you'll see it kicks off with step one. 
Now, what makes GPTs really useful is you can build it once and reuse it, share it with other folks. In fact, I'll show you. Come up here and say create. You can invite people within your workspace to see it. By default, only I will be able to see the GPT. Or you can open it up to anyone inside your workspace. When you see Mesa here, my workspace is called Mesa. So if I say publish it to Mesa, it'll be visible to everyone in the workspace. Or I can make it public with a link. I'm gonna make me that link and I'll put it down in the video description if you wanna have a play with that GPT we just created. So for anyone that now has this GPT, on the left-hand side here, they'll have the option and can chat with that GPT. And there are a bunch of ways you could continue to build on this, like a, a template for your one-on-one -on -one meetings with staff, a template for S-Corp annual meeting notes, you know, those meeting notes. Lots of ways that you could extend this one specifically, but a wild thing that was recently released is you can now pull a GPT into any conversation, like midstream. So, for example, I'll start a new conversation here. Tell me a dad joke. <laughs> I can now just hit the at symbol, then tag any GPTs I have access to, a uh, meeting work paper generator, then chuck my transcript in there. So if you think about this, even bigger, more ambitious processes, you can chain together the functions of multiple GPTs in sequence and do some wild things. Teaser alert, stick around in the end, we're gonna be doing that. It's, it's gonna get real nerdy. Okay, now, the obvious question about all the above, you are probably fully clutching your pearls. You maniac, what if there was something sensitive in that meeting transcript? What if the client said the launch code's out loud? Every firm needs to have a responsible use policy for AI. I ran through how to build your own on my podcast up here and have your IT partner review it. While there are uh, wild and mysterious things we can do with AI that we're still discovering, how these tools use your data is not mysterious. That is clear as day, but just a hypothetical, what if I, I don't know, what if I put my social security number in there? <gasps> don't do it! What? No! Oh! It's okay, we're all still here. What have you done? Now, was that a good idea? No, it probably wasn't. But let me walk you through what just happened with that social security number. Did my social security number just get trained into a model? The answer is, it depends. Let's look at all the different chat GPT plans. On the business plans, or when using the API, that's what your software providers use, no prompts, that social security number included, would ever be trained into the model. They just aren't. 18 months ago, that wasn't the case. All prompts were trained into the model. This has gotten way better, and that is now no longer the case. It's why I recommend firms use the team plan. It's basically 30 bucks per user per month, and enables sharing things internally, like the GPT we just created. Now, what if, what if I wasn't on a business plan? Well, on a plus plan, you can disable training of the model in the settings. But let's say we either didn't do that, or I was on a free plan. First off, ChatGPT is actually gonna scold me. Bad human. Second, before it's trained into the model, OpenAI actually runs the prompt through a process of their own that removes any personally identifying information. They don't want that in the training data. Here from their FAQs, they say, actually they take steps to reduce the amount of personal information in their training data sets. But I probably don't wanna rely on that, right? So let's say my social slipped through somehow and now a bad actor wants to retrieve my social. Uh, exactly. This is wrong! It really, it, it can't. I mean, did you, did you really think it would just fetch a social security number? Yeah, it's not gonna help you there. In fact, yeah, it generally won't be helpful here, but let's just say, let's just say we jailbroke it. We found a way around that OpenAI hasn't figured out yet. <laughs> Even if we did, can you actually prompt specific details out of an LLM? After all, that's not really how language models work. They aren't databases where you can put something in only to later then pull it out. 
What they do is they generate a token, kind of a word, at a time, according to the probability of what the next word would be. And a good example of this in action is the current court case between OpenAI and the New York Times. What you can see here, they've gotten ChatGPT to prompt the text of articles word for word. And this happens because the article, or the free portion of the article from the New York Times, is reposted umpteen different places across the internet. Meaning probabilistically, what? The model may well continue to give you those words in sequence because it sees it in a whole bunch of different places, which is very different than uh, Steve's box one from his 2020 Form W2. So to recap, your prompts being trained into the model shouldn't be an issue because that's not a thing on the business plans of ChatGPT. Number two, but even if you didn't use a business plan, there's a reasonable chance that it would actually be stripped out of the training data altogether because OpenAI doesn't want that in their training data. But even if it didn't, ChatGPT's controls and conversation don't let you ask for that. But even if they did, that's not really how LLMs work to begin with, like retrieving specific data. But hey, the responsible adult thing to do here is just use a business plan that doesn't train the model. And frankly, all of this spookiness around my data getting trained into the model takes away from the way more important security issue. Can I enforce multi-factor authentication for my team? Because most data breaches these days happen from someone just logging into your account who shouldn't be there. Now, with ChatGPT, you can now enable two-factor authentication, but it has to be done by each user. I, the administrator, can't enforce it for all of my users. Only on the enterprise tier, for companies over 150 users, can you currently enforce it for all users that have it. And the unfortunate truth here is, most of the tools in the accounting space uh, have this exact same issue. If I put a sensitive client detail into a piece of software, the most likely way somebody's going to get to it is via my own login. Phishing, not using a password manager. The dreaded password sticky note, you maniac. So on the spectrum of how secure that app, ChatGPT is somewhere in the middle, maybe actually just above average now in our space, now that you can enable 2FA. When we did a roundup late last year of the, the top 14 leading practice management systems for firms, over half don't let you enforce two-factor authentication, meaning anyone with your email or password can get into that system. That is the home of every sensitive detail in your firm, the PM. And if we weren't so focused on the AI boogeyman, we could focus on the real important thing, getting more of these tools we use to let us enforce two-factor authentication to secure access. So let's move the category forward as a whole by focusing on the right things. And if I can leave you with one more, one more little tip, don't put sensitive info in any app that it doesn't need to be in. I didn't just put my social security number to ChatGPT. Oh my gosh, thanks goodness. Any app that you use, regardless of security, Never put more info in that app than it absolutely needs. That's just, that's that's an easy one. If I'm gonna copy paste something into ChatGPT, there's no reason to paste in the company's name. Now, does this ultimately mean that it is fine to put sensitive information into ChatGPT? It's for you to decide. But it isn't any more bad than most of the other apps we are already using that don't enforce two-factor authentication. That doesn't make it okay, but all the conversation around like the AI spookies is taking away from the more important things. Now, would I put sensitive info into ChatGPT? Probably not, I'd probably say it either has to be non-sensitive info or redacted info for the same reason that I wouldn't put a social into another app I have that doesn't have two-factor authentication. It's not an AI thing, it's a cloud app thing. Can we please get back to the use cases? Sorry, when your audience is accountants, for every one minute you talk about technology, you have to also talk one minute about security. Should we leave that in? Let's leave that in. Okay, number stuff. Check this out. This is a GPT that I made. I will link it down below. On the left-hand side, I'm gonna open the GPT number matcher. On the right, I've got a tail as old as time. You got a set of numbers that total up to this other set of numbers. Maybe it's a bunch of batch deposits of smaller amounts. Maybe you're just trying to reconcile something and you're stuck. And this isn't a trivial problem to solve because you know how many ways these numbers can go into this other set of numbers? I'm gonna put the number on screen. This is the total number of solutions. That is for real. That is the actual maths. And it's one of the biggest numbers ever. Now, I'm going to show you how to solve it with the GPT. So I'm gonna say, for these payments, paste that list in, and these deposits, Paste the other list in. Match payments into each deposit, only using payments on or before the date of each deposit. Start with the first deposit. Machine goes burr. 
It's gonna run some code to figure this out. Here in the spreadsheet, I've got another tab that is the solution. I've color coded all the matches. You'll see some payments don't even have matches. We are going easy here. Let's see how the output looks. 10 bucks, 78, 635, 252, 12, 3018, 615, 391, goodbye. I then have a go through each deposit after that, figuring it out one by one. Now, this works about 75% of the time. I'll be fully transparent with you. Most of the time it will go through and figure each of those out, the ones for which there are a solution. The other 25% of the time it will figure out a way to fall in a space. And usually the solution is to like get it to go back and redo its work. And it still beats me having to figure it out myself. Check out that GPT in the video description if you wanna play with it. Ways you could build on it to do other interesting things. Tax pros, you know how when you enter the tax return into your tax software, uh, the balance sheet never balances? I mean, it always did for me, I'm talking about you. How about something like this that takes your trial balance and tries every combination of numbers to work out how you're now $823,502 out of balance? Boy, would that have saved me some time, you some time, and don't forget, you can build these things and share them with your team. And worth considering, this is the worst that this tech will ever be. In general, each new generation of model, the stuff that was like the bleeding edge, like the hardest thing the previous gen could do is usually table stakes for the next generation of the model. We'll be getting a new model from OpenAI this year. Very excited to see what it can do, but we are just getting started with all this stuff. How about checklists? This example and the last example were both from my weekly newsletter. Be sure to subscribe to that to get that sort of thing in your inbox every week. Checklists, they are an accountant's best friend, but checklist blindness is real. The third time you've done a lap on that thing, you're like, Burr. but what if a checklist could complete itself? Huh? What if AI could look through a checklist and sign off? Dude, uh, it's a little fringe right now. It works like relatively well, but self-completing checklists are the future, baby. You heard it here first. Here's one such example. Let's say my team made this GPT that does quality assurance on balance sheets. Here we've chucked a balance sheet in and it has completed four tasks. First, it's gonna ensure it's cash basis and it looks like it is. Second, it's gonna ensure it's a comparative balance sheet, current month to prior month. Nice work, you passed the test. Third, it's gonna confirm that assets equal liabilities plus equity. Looks good there. Fourth, it's going to produce a work paper confirming it did the work. Look at this. Pretty darn ugly, right? And as we discussed a couple weeks ago in another ChatGPT video, it can annotate PDFs. Look at that, there's little highlights and markups there. But pretty cool, we've got this work paper now with highlights and everything. And you can see how this could get really powerful if you build some GPTs for your team, particularly if you then chain them together in sequence using the at symbol to start a conversation with the GPT like we talked about before. So to wrap this up here, I'm gonna show you what I'm calling a controller GPT. And this borrows from the fact that many of the language models we are using are actually controller models. When you ask it to do something, its job is to hand that request off to an expert model that's really good at that specific thing, take the response back and hand it back to you. So we are going to make a controller GPT that walks a user through making requests of several other GPTs. Yo dog, it's GPTception. But memes aside, you could theoretically do like big, long, complex tasks this way. Rather than making a single GPT to try to do a bunch of different things and probably not doing it well, we're gonna break it out into several sequential GPTs. So remember that GPT we made earlier for creating work papers from meeting transcripts? Take a look at this. I've renamed it. Now it is step one in a larger process. So we got step one, generate meeting work paper. But now there is a step two, QA that meeting work paper. Specifically, this GPT is gonna check a few things. One, confirm there's a numbered list of points from the meeting. Step two, confirm there is a separate numbered list of follow-ups, or that it confirmed that there were no follow-ups. Step three, a list of participants. Step four, the type of meeting. Step five, how to show the date and the time. And then step six, give the user a table of all five tests, explaining whether it passed or failed them. So that is step two in the process, but we now have a third GPT, the controller GPT. And its job, take a look at this. You walk a user through calling multiple GPTs to complete a process. Take the user through each step, prompting them to complete the next one in sequence. Step one, have the user call the first GPT by mentioning it. At number one, generate meeting work paper. Once generated, continue to the next step. Have it mentioned step two, etc. So it is a two-step process overseen by a manager of that process. And this kind of cool. Bonus points to the first person who links a GPT in the comments that's like, a 10 step process broken down. So I'm gonna hop in and talk with the controller GPT. 
Let's begin. The controller instructs me to mention step one, pull that GPT into the conversation. And you can see up above the chat window now, above the message box, we're now talking with the step one GPT. From inside the conversation with the controller GPT, Man, I told you this was gonna get nerdy. I'll upload the transcript, and it'll go through the process of making the work paper that we saw earlier in the video. I got my work paper now, looking oh so resplendent. Ooh, those aren't numbered though. This work paper is gonna get torched. Okay, now I'm done talking with step one. I'm gonna hit the X. Okay, got my work paper. It's gonna prompt me now to reach out to the second GPT, so I'll type the at symbol, O2. And now we're talking with the GPT that is the second step. And I'm gonna give it the work paper we just created. And now it's running that quality assurance process. Okay, fail, 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 and fail. Got some work to do on the work paper, but otherwise, goodbye. Now, why go through the process of building this like multi-step thing? Let's not forget we're building software here. You build it once and any number of people can use it any number of times. What you're looking at is genuinely the future of software. It's semantic. You'll get people like Bill Gates saying, hmm, software's just gonna be chat and voice now. And that's pretty hard to imagine, doing accounting in a chat box or over voice. But you know what we do over voice now? We talk with other humans. We chat with them. We tell them what to do. And that's the future of software, telling it what to do. We just did it. The models will get better. So it'll be better at reasoning and kind of reading between the lines and doing bigger tasks. But this is it, gang. This is the future of accounting work, probably with an AI agent that works on your desktop or in a Chrome extension. But this is how we get AI to do our work for us. For now, it's a chat window. In the very near future, it's clicking and typing stuff on your screen. And it's why folks like Google CEO say AI will be more significant than electricity or even fire. Because what could be more fire than QA on a meeting work? Jason. Jeez Louise. Is it time? Uh, yes, it is ad read time. Tell the nice people at home what you do, Hugo. Of course, I'm Hugo from LiveFlow. Is that a new, that's a sporty looking tote. Thank you, it's from a recent accounting conference I was at with LiveFlow. You were at an accounting conference? That was, uh, I mean. Was that just a bit, or? As far as this ad read is concerned, I was. Okay. But you'll see LiveFlow at a whole bunch of accounting conferences this year. Man, I love accounting conferences. And it's how you know LiveFlow is investing in accountants and iterating on accountant feedback. Which is actually, it's actually where the new consolidations feature came from, right? That's right, we launched consolidations after accountants asked for a better way to roll up company files. So, LiveFlow, if you're not familiar. I, I am familiar. Not talking to you, Hugo. So LiveFlow syncs your QuickBooks Online data to Google Sheets. Specific reports, specific accounts, report templates. Sync that stuff over one time or get it to like auto sync and update that stuff on the fly. And the cherry on top is the recently announced consolidations, which lets you roll up companies with different chart of accounts in a snap. I recently did a five minute sponsored demo day on this channel a couple months back. Works pretty well. And there's even more great updates on the way. Oh, here you go, you little devil. Learn more about LiveFlow via the link in the video description or check out that demo day we did recently. So as a profession, let's keep finding rad new ways to use AI. Then once we get to grips with it, we'd help our clients do the same. Kind of like uh, everything else. Cloud adoption, uh, tax legislation, COVID relief, uh, security best practices. Oh, Zoom meetings, remember that? That was fun. Calendly links. Uh, why to not keep sending me all of your sensitive stuff over email? Digital payments? Value billing? 